Hey everybody, Michael Snyder here, Pacific Northwest Weather Watch, and tonight we're going to talk about notable windstorms of the Pacific Northwest. This is a continuation of the windstorm series I'm going to do here. It's going to continue over the next couple of weeks as we count down the greatest windstorms that, to hit the Pacific Northwest here. And we're going to go over three different ones today. The Thanksgiving Day Storm of 1983. We're going to go over a storm system that took advantage of some terrain features here for the, across the Pacific Northwest, and we're going to take a look at a late developing storm that hit the Oregon coast as well. So let's just get into things here. You can see that about 270,000 people were without power. This hit just at the worst time, late morning, when all the turkeys were being cooked. And this was a huge amount of the population here across the Seattle metro where most of the power outages were. So a good time also to bring up, do not use barbecue or propane to heat or try to cook things inside your house. People die from carbon monoxide poisoning during almost every single wind event that brings widespread power outages here across Pacific Northwest. So heads up for that, cook it outside and check out some of the wind speeds around. Look at Astoria, 62 miles per hour. SeaTac, 62. Olympia, 60 miles per hour. Once the wind starts getting up in the upper 50s and 60 miles per hour, bad things start happening. Widespread power outages occur. You can see it was blustery down into Oregon, but this was, for the most part, a Puget Sound windstorm. We also had a pretty good run-up to the event here. A very active November during the 10th, the 13th, and the 19th. We had windstorms move across the region as well. Now, taking a look here, you can see this system basically kind of a late breaking storm system here. You can see it come up the Oregon coast here and really curl up into a quite a deep low, powerful gradient moving across the Puget Sound, kind of an archetype here for a Puget Sound windstorm, similar to the inaugural day storm, just not quite as powerful of a gradient across the region here. So it packed quite a punch as you can see it then move up into British Columbia. Now you can see peak gusts at SeaTac Airport, November of 1983. You see the run up to that one, two, three storms, and then the last one on the Thanksgiving Day storm, over 60 miles per hour at SeaTac, and that's when big problems start to occur as far as power outages are concerned. Now taking a look at the map here, you can see Hoekland, look at this, in a insane 81 miles per hour a story again at 62 cape disappointment with big winds olympia SeaTac, look bellingham 64 big winds in everett as well friday harbor 52 and you can see the track of the storm systems that moved across the olympia Peninsula here, bringing some pretty good winds all the way down to the Oregon coast there, probably all the way down to Newport, Oregon too. Of course, the graphics, courtesy of Wolf Reed, he's been kind enough to let me use some of his graphics here in these uh, presentations coming up. So tracing back that Thanksgiving Day storm, we come all the way across to the Western Pacific here. It's the Philippines, and you can see violent typhoon Orchid, November 1983. We even have a satellite image of it here. Slow moving system off the coast of the Philippines here. It was actually responsible for 167 fatalities when a vessel capsized due to highways in shark infested waters out there. Nasty stuff, folks. Um, you can see that energy that was off the Philippines here and this eventually tracks all the way across Pacific Ocean meets up with even some more moisture here that came up from Hawaii starts to interact with the upper level trough and you're going across the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands very cold air versus nice rich subtropical moisture powerful pressure gradient that moves into the Pacific Northwest and causes that strong windstorm to dive into western Washington there at the Worst of times there for Thanksgiving Day turkey lovers. So now looking, this is February 13th, 1979, the Hood Canal Bridge windstorm. A lot of you might have heard about this one here. This bridge is over a mile long here, and you can see how it just collapsed a huge portion of it during this windstorm. So again, it was over a mile long here. It was the first floating pontoon bridge built over saltwater subject to tides, and the tides could vary as much as 18 feet in this area. So you can imagine the engineering headaches this would give an engineer. Um, this is where the Hood Canal Bridge is located, There's Seattle here, and you can take ferries to get across, or you can drive south around through the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and cross here off to the Olympic Peninsula there towards Squim in Port Angeles. So taking a look here, it sunk at about 7 a.m. That during that powerful windstorm, the winds were gusting in excess of 100 miles per hour and probably were sustained at over 80 miles per hour. Just an incredible windstorm here. And it's amazing that any bridge can still even hold up against conditions like this. But it was a quite a unique situation there, and I'll show you why here in a moment. Now, you can see the storm system was no joke. I mean, it was... It was it was coming. You could see it coming for a while. It was a powerful storm. I mean, this dropped down into the 960 
8 millibar range and dove right to Vancouver Island would bring a powerful windstorm across the Oregon Washington coastline and for the interior a bit as well but this one was a little bit unique and uh, looking at 5,000 foot winds here you can see how the Olympic Mountains are kind of like a rock in a big old river here and as it moves over the top of that we get a lee low that formed just near that bridge here the hood canal bridge formed just to the northwest of it here and you can see that there look at this pressure gradient that existed right over the bridge windy conditions really a lot of places with this storm but you can see it just packed from seattle all the way towards this mesoscale low that a lot of times does form in the wake of the olympic mountains here when we get strong flow coming across it so a good diagram here of a lee side low and you can see SeaTac 80, you can see 80 or SeaTac 60, sorry, 80 plus here for the Hood Canal Bridge area with gusts over 100 miles per hour. Navy Whidbey Island 68, Bellingham an incredible 75. You can see it really got a story of Tillamook all the way down North Bend, almost down towards California there. Hoaklam a big gust at 66 as well. Graphics courtesy of Wolf Reed again. He's kind enough to let me use some of his graphics from his website for these presentations. Um, now, looking at this, the span remained closed for 3.5 years. Replacement of the lost section cost about $143 million in 1982 dollars there. Um, and this was the observations for SeaTac. 10 plus hours, 30 miles per hour or more at SeaTac. So prolonged winds with that mesoscale low hanging out there and that strong southerly flow, south southwesterly flow, I should say, across the Olympic Mountains. And you can see this peaking up to 60 miles per hour, dying down for a bit and coming back at times. Some pretty gusty conditions there for SeaTac. And look at Astoria gusting over 75 miles per hour. Look at the gusty conditions with this storm. Prolonged, you know, I mean, you're looking at what, 1600 all the way to 22. You're, you're dealing with many hours of some pretty high winds with some pretty interesting peaks and lulls as the storm went by. So now we're going to take a look at the February 7, 2002 called the South Valley Surprise. There's probably going to be some of my viewers here that remember this storm down there through Oregon. Fairly localized, so it's not going to make the all-time greatest windstorm let list here in the Pacific Northwest, but for that localized area, it was a very powerful system. Probably the second strongest windstorm to impact portions around Eugene, Oregon, and some of the coastal areas since that Columbus Day storm in 1962. And it was kind of a, you know, a late alert on this storm. And I'm going to show you why that happened. They did put out high wind warnings, but they were kind of late on this. And I'll show you why here in a moment. But February 2002, that windstorm caused over $30 million in damage, resulted in presidential disaster declaration for five Oregon counties. Pretty Pretty brutal windstorm there for central Oregon. Now you can see here, you see a couple lows here. You see the parent low up here. You might get your focus lost on this storm here, or maybe looking out at this next storm out here, trying to wonder what the impacts are going to be. And then you see this late breaking system here on the Oregon coast. That's the one that got them here. Um, yeah, the ones that spin south of the parent low sometimes can wrap up pretty dramatically and cast a powerful grading across the region here. Some high winds really blasted the Oregon coast up towards Eugene. And you can see it here. It's only a 998 millibar low, but the gradient on the south side of the storm was very intense as it moved inland. Now, taking a look here, this is the polar lobe, just kind of showing you guys what was going on with this system as it came across here. And this is typical of our windstorms here. You have to have this polar lobe. You need a great temperature gradient here across the area to really bring these strong winds into the region. So just kind of showing you this here is Alaska, BC and Washington down towards Oregon. You can see that polar just going to reach out and punch the Oregon coast there. Now taking a look here at 5,000 feet, you can see a classic signature also of our cyclones here as they move on shore. You can see the warm air move out ahead of it and powerful temperature gradient that gave birth to the strong winds along the Oregon coast in towards Eugene here. Now, taking a look here, you can see the storm kind of develop last minute. You got this comma cloud signature is what we call it here. Again, a nice um, satellite image here from Wolf Reed. Um, you can see the bent back occlusion. This is an infrared satellite imagery here. And you can imagine the cold front being somewhere here, stretching across up into southwest Washington. The warm front would be a little further north. And where they meet becomes an occluded front. And when that occluded front starts to bend back in this hook shape here, we call it the bent back occlusion. And this is usually where the most powerful winds and the strongest pressure rise occur on the storm right there now look at the proximity of this low if you're on the south side immediate south side you're getting the most severe winds you're getting much lesser winds on the north side of this storm as you can see here the damaging winds occurred in this blue swath as it moved inland lebanon eugene 
Mapleton, Sea Lion Caves, Winchester Bay. You can see some of these wind gusts along the Oregon coast. Very powerful little punch there on the coastline. Eugene, Oregon peaked to 70 miles per hour here. And you can see some pretty good gusts. Was not that long lasting of a storm there, however. Now take a look here. Somebody's Davis weather monitor too, gusting up towards 73 miles per hour near Lebanon, Oregon. But again, pretty short lived for those really severe winds, but they were damaging indeed. Look at some of the damage um, here on some of the trees. This is Wolf Reed images as well. Look at some of these power lines and these power poles just wiped out here. Pretty interesting that a storm of that strength could do this kind of damage. And look where this hit. You can kind of see this impact Oregon coast and move inland across Eugene, Lebanon area. Look, Portland, 31 miles per hour. You know, that's a, that's a little bit windy, but that's nothing compared to these 70 mile per hour gusts and 80 plus mile per hour gusts for some areas here along the coastline. And look at SeaTac and Olympia. You wouldn't even know a windstorm was going on down here through Oregon. So you can see we do get these little windstorms moving in here that can pack quite the punch. But anyway, if you guys want more of Wolf Reed's work as well. You can see he does a write-up on a lot of windstorms around here, and he does a lot of uh, work for windstorms in the British Columbia power industry up there too. And I'll link some of that in the description below. But so this is just kind of a, a precursor here, and I'm working on the top windstorms to come here. And I want to, I want to do probably individual videos for individual storms as I come up here. So I want to talk about them in detail. Some of these storms are really amazing. And, you know, I always look forward to these next wind storms occurring. And sometimes it can take 10, 15, 20 years for the next one to roll around. But when it does, a lot of those days, um, you just kind of remember it, you know, like on certain days, I remember what I wore, what brought, what I had for breakfast, this kind of windstorms when they're damaging things and trees are falling around you and you're out of power for a few days and you're doing all kinds of unusual things. You tend to remember those storms. So anyway, I'm going to do those top windstorms one video at a time here. I'll probably have it done here in the next couple of weeks. I'm getting a lot of information stored and the presentations ready. So hopefully you guys like this video. Leave some comments below on what you want to see me include when I do the really big windstorms that are coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And I will talk to you guys tomorrow morning. We'll take another look at the weather then. And I uh, hope you guys are having a good night. I'll talk to you guys later.